people are predicting the possibility of a race war. It's not a problem in Alabama alone. It's a world problem. Wherever you have two races living. Is there an answer? Yes, there is an answer. The answer is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And there is a possibility of spiritual brotherhood in Christ alone. I have some very sad news for all of you. And I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Graham, I believe you've just been informed of the tragic death of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes, and uh, I was just informed about uh, five minutes ago, and uh, it comes as one of the greatest shocks of my entire life. Uh, his friends called him Mike, and uh, that's the way I knew him. Billy and Martin were good friends, and a lot of whites damned Billy for that. They said, why would you hook yourself up with a communist? He's no good. Billy said, no, he's my brother. Because Billy told him there was a time when I didn't take a stand for the race problem. And I preached to segregated audiences. But I got to know Martin Luther King, and I felt what he felt. And I took a stand for an open crusade. We demanded integration almost from the beginning of our meetings in the South. And as a result, I think that this laid a groundwork at that time. Now today, it's almost impossible for the present generation to understand what things were in those days and what it took to be that way, and how many threatening letters we got, and uh, how many threats against my family as a result of the stand that we took at that time. I think both Dr. Graham and my father uh, were trying to make the world a better place. There is no excuse ever for hatred. There is no excuse ever for bigotry and intolerance and prejudice. We are to love as God loved us. We don't need any guns. We don't need any bullets. We don't need any physical ammunition. We have a power. All we need is to pick up the ammunition of love. Take in our hands the weapons of justice. Then put on the breastplate of righteousness and the whole armor of God and just not much. They were different, obviously, in their style and their approach, but I think their heart and their goal was the same. Billy Graham's first public acts against racial segregation took place at his crusades in the South during the early 1950s. At the time, it was common practice for ropes to separate the white from the black sections. He walked into the crusade and they had ropes up. Billy saw them. Blacks were supposed to sit back of that and uh, the whites would sit in front. Uh, I was uh, uh, appalled at it and decided that I had to speak out on it and had to do something about it. I said, no more of this. And uh, I went to the head usher and asked him if he would remove the uh, ropes and he said, no, he wouldn't. Billy got up from the platform and he walked down past the ushers and took the ropes down himself. And I remember that the head usher resigned. And there was quite a little flack about that. That was a historic moment in history with the church. And that opened up his friendship with the Martin Luther King and other people. And he really practiced what he preached. In a 1956 article published in Life magazine, in which Billy made a plea for an end to intolerance, he wrote, it is not sufficient to urge people to love their neighbor unless we lead them also to the capacity to love. Christ gives men this capacity. We must meet Christ. We must know him as our Lord and our Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts, we shall be saved. His approach was more of trying to get people into the relationship with Christ, that that would transform their mindset and, and the way in which they live. So they would see people differently. 
um, and thus treat people differently. Everybody's calling is not the same. And Mr. Graham's calling is the proclamation of the gospel in which um, if he can reach men's hearts through the Spirit of God, that can change a man's whole life completely. Billy's burden to end the blight of racism through evangelism continued to motivate his actions. This would be evident during the early days of the 1957 New York Crusade. In New York, Mr. Billy Graham makes a dramatic denunciation. There's something wrong with human nature. What is it in the nature of men that causes men to lie and hate and cheat and steal and lust and have pride and bigotry and intolerance and racial intolerance? What is it that causes men to have these terrible things down inside of them? The problem of the world tonight is sin. Billy had said, I'm reaching 28,000 people every night at Madison Square Garden. The place is packed and jammed. But he said, I'm frustrated, I'm concerned, and I'm not reaching people of color. And he said, I don't want this to be a white man's crusade. He said, Howard, what must I do? I said, there's one thing you could do. He said, what? I said, go where they are. He said, I'll go. So one Sunday afternoon, we went up there. I made all the arrangements. We were going to have it Salem Methodist Church, a large church in, in Harlem. And we ended up with 8,000 people there that afternoon. Then the next Sunday, we went to Brooklyn. 10,000 people turned out. Billy preached. They responded. He said, will you come? They said, Billy, since you came to Brooklyn, we're going to come to Madison Square Garden. And that was the beginning of the change of the racial climate at Madison Square Garden. There was a browning, a coloring of that tremendous crowd. During the New York Crusade, another very interesting thing happened. One night he invited uh, Martin Luther King to come and pray. And again, he got some nasty letters. They said, why do you want to have that in preacher here? Again, Billy said, I don't care. I'm going to do what's right. So that night, Martin came. He sat on the platform right next to Billy. So Martin got up and prayed. I have never heard that man pray a prayer like he prayed. And he really touched heaven, so to speak. Tonight, we're delighted to have from Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King, the minister of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Heavenly Father, out of whose mind this great cosmic universe has been created, we come recognizing our dependence on thee. We stand amid the forces of truth, and yet we deliberately lie. We stand amid the compelling urgency of the Lord of love as exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ. And yet we live our lives so often in the dungeons of hate. For all of these sins, oh God forgive. We thank thee this evening for the marvelous things which have been done in this city and through the dynamic preaching of this great evangelist. We ask thee, O oh God, to continue blessing him, give him continued power and authority, and as we listen to him tonight, grant that our hearts and spirits will be open to the divine inflow. All of these things we ask in the name of him who taught us to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, I think with Dr. Graham and Dr. King on the same platform, more than likely sent a very powerful me message, especially to those in the South. And uh, that took courage, a lot of courage on their part, as a matter of fact, because it could put their lives in danger as well. A lot of things that the black pastors didn't know was that Mr. Graham had helped Martin Luther King in many, many areas with regard to his imprisonment and paying of fines and, and uh, that kind of thing and encouragement along the way. It wasn't something Mr. Graham did for his own prominence and to get 
uh, press interviews out of it, but it was something he did because of his concern for justice and uh, his desire to help people, but he did it in his way. From Eisenhower to Kennedy to Johnson and then Nixon, Billy worked closely with all these presidents, encouraging them to take steps to end racial segregation. When they tried to integrate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, that was 1957. And uh, President Eisenhower called me on the phone and he said, Billy, did you see the picture in the paper this morning of uh, the black man being kicked uh, down on the street in uh, Little Rock? And I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, I'm thinking we're gonna have to send some troops in there to hold that down and to stop that. He said, uh, what do you think about it? I said, well, I don't think you have any alternative. I said, it can't go on like it's going now and something dramatic has to take place. Billy also offered to hold a crusade in the troubled city, but the local committee thought it would be impossible at that time. When the meetings did take place two years later, their impact would prove to be far-reaching. Almost 50 years ago, my Sunday school teacher took me to Little Rock to hear Billy Graham's crusade. The schools were closed because of Little Rock Central High School integration crisis. The White Citizens Council in Little Rock tried to convince, even to pressure, Billy Graham and all of his people to preach to a segregated audience. And he told them that if they insisted on that, he would cancel the crusade and tell the whole world why. So here we were, with neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood in my state on the verge of violence, and yet tens of thousands of black and white Christians there together in a football stadium. And when he issued the call at the end of the message, thousands came down, holding hands, arm in arm, crying. It was the beginning of the end of the Old South in my home state. I will never forget it. I had the privilege of being at the White House at a party the night the civil rights bill was passed and Hubert Humphrey came in about nine or 10 o'clock. He was very tired and he came straight over to me and he said, Billy, he said, this bill will never really be implemented unless it comes from here. And he said, this is the job of you and the church to help bring about love in the hearts of the people. I believe that the answer to our great moral problems, our social problems, lies in the gospel of Christ and in the transformation that he can bring. We need legislation, yes. But legislation cannot improve the morals of America alone or our social problems alone. It must come from something deeper because our problem is basically spiritual. We've passed all the civil rights laws that you, can, you can't think of anything hardly they haven't passed. But that hasn't made everybody love each other automatically. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples in that ye have love one to another. That is a supernatural love given to you by God when you receive Christ. Jesus said, follow me, come and change the world with me. Billy's concern for racial equality extended to South Africa during apartheid. He repeatedly refused to visit unless the government would allow a non-segregated meeting. In 1973, Billy Graham prevailed and held the first ever integrated public meetings 20 years before apartheid ended. And he said to the thousands there, apartheid is sin, and the papers carried it. Christianity is not a white man's religion, and don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. His gospel is for everyone. I think I remember him as someone who opened my eyes to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He'll bring a peace and a joy to your heart that you've never known. Open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, and he will. I respected him for being genuine and authentic and not pretentious. I've listened to a lot of preachers in my life, 
Sometimes I'm like, I hear your words, but your spirit doesn't seem to connect. Dr. Graham's spirit uh, connected with the word that he delivered. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You want him in your heart and life tonight. I'm going to ask that you come right now.